Good day. You've caught me in the middle of a work session here and I've already begun on this study, which of course is not much, it's just a line or two. And so um, I got so enthused with this particular composition that I just went right ahead before we started rolling. So here we are, once again at the Cable Easel with a local scene of Long Island. Uh, local origination is what we're all about. And this one is on the North Shore between Setauket and Stony Brook in a preserve, a nature preserve called West Meadow Beach. It's very typical of Long Island. It is so typical that anybody who sees it is going to say, ah, that must be Long Island. It's nowhere else that looks like this. And uh, in it is happening a rather wonderful event. There is a, um, there is a, uh, a gang of um, snowy egrets uh, resting here on their way south, probably to South America or the Yucatan Peninsula or maybe even, or I don't know how far down snowy egrets go, but I'll bet they may go down even down to the Falkland Islands because I've seen photographs of them down there. So here we are the resting place. Now, this is the beginning of the layout, my blob of sky paint is there ready and waiting here is the um, here is the gentle uh, diagonal which I'm always hoping to find in uh, landscape compositions because it gives interest and it leads the eye into the picture and here is the foreground which is all weeds which will be able to be one of my show-off uh, techniques of how to do weeds uh, but it's the last part of the whole picture you work towards the foreground this is part one obviously of a study uh, part Part two will come naturally following it, and um, the uh, the uh, the style in which I work is that I like to work right on this canvas for large areas such as the sky, which, when this was shot, was a cloudless, absolutely uh, wonderful, wonderful weather pattern, a uh, high and uh, tolerable breezes and winds, and no clouds whatsoever. If there's one that sneaks in on us here, I will probably put it in because I think clouds lead lend a lot of interest to um, to skies. Otherwise Otherwise, you sort of look like you're looking at a backdrop. But I'm mixing cerulean blue, some quick drying uh, Grumbacher's uh, white, MG white, and a touch, just a slight touch of Prussian blue. Uh, a lethal color to be avoided uh, most of the time, but sometimes it gives a certain snap to uh, the brilliance of blue, which happens on this, uh, on this island of ours at certain times of year. I'm going to bring the blue clear on down to the land mass in the distance because the laciness of the tree, uh, I need to be able to use the background as an overlay for the painting of this tree. A technique which you uh, probably understand by now because I do it every single time. I'm going to, uh, there is a blend of paler color toward, of the sky towards the land mass in the distance, which means that I'm going to put on this mixed blue tone, uh, put it at the top of the canvas and uh, work its way down and uh, then introduce a little bit more uh, white and some more blue to make, the, to, to make the blend color. And then I probably will uh, smooth this out with a brush. Not the dreaded fan brush. The dreaded fan brush is for an effect that I am not fond of. Only occasionally do I want it when I need a special, very smooth effect. But I like to have a sort of a textured quality to my paintings, a, a quality which uh, which is gotten by applying paint with um, 
with purposeful strokes and also with a certain amount of, uh, of expertise. Uh, I think that if you apply paint with, a, uh, with anything but an uh, artist's brush, you're going to get a uh, bathroom wall or the equivalent of how you paint the inside of your home when it needs to be repainted. Certainly not in fine arts. You don't use, um, you don't use um, uh, uh, household painting brushes to do the fine arts. So um, whether or not the, uh, the average viewer has got the patience to do this is, um, is unknown to me, but if uh, the, only the person themselves will know uh, if they have the patience to do this. Patience is one thing, style, technique, and comprehension is another. I'm going to smooth that out a little bit. If you see the texture of that, I'm going to use a brush that has no color on it whatsoever because uh, then I don't run the, run the risk of getting smudges and smears. And I like to see that a blend of the skies, which are typical of this area, uh, take place in a uh, nice, subtle way. Uh, the, um, the blend of the sky to me is one of the, uh, one of the signs between the amateur and the so-called beginning professional that you will apply the paint in such a way that it is uh, the blends are um, are uh, clear clever and also very subtle I'm not sure that the monitor will pick up the subtlety in difference of tone of this particular sky but after all the sky here on Long Island uh, many times is extremely subtle uh, the um, the uh, event that is taking place out there on West Meadow Beach Road in the, um, in the Nature Preserve is uh, available for all to see. Uh, my request to you personally is if you decide to go down there in your car and see it, go at 20 miles an hour, observe it, you know, get everything that you can out of the trip, and that will show you, show, show you a great deal more of what there is to see, and it also is a gesture of respect for this environment, which is fragile at best. There is um, there's a lot happening uh, in uh, Long Island, which uh, seems to uh, ignore the fact that the, uh, that the environment, although it bounces back very well after major uh, traumas, um, is still a very fragile environment. That monitor doesn't show very much of the subtle blend, but there is one. It's a little bit paler towards the land mass. Now, speaking of land mass, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, mix up. Uh, a tone here which is sort of the, con the combination of all sorts of colors that I've been using on this palette and it's kind of gray in tones. It needs a touch of green in it for that uh, distance and a little bit, a little touch of this um, sienna and see whether or not that distance shot which is beginning to very slightly show signs of something that is going to happen within the next few weeks and that means it's all going to turn a kind of a rusty, hazy, uh, wonderful, rich look of fall colors. Uh, maybe if the summer hasn't been too dry and too unfriendly, those fall colors will in fact be brilliant. If, uh, if uh, the weather pattern uh, was so that um, the moisture that, was, that is needed to turn all these uh, trees into colors uh, was not enough, then we will, won't get much of a spectacular change. However, uh, uh, this color is um, a lovely subtle uh, grayish green something or other somewhere in between well why don't I just put a few suggestions of some of the rusty tones that are gonna more than likely find themselves there they're all very very green now but I think I'm going to just sort of play for a minute and be the creative one and introduce um, a spot here and there because within a matter of days I think this is all going to change I saw it this morning uh, driving through the uh, three village area on the north shore there was one uh, one very gung-ho uh, Norway maple that was uh, actually turned almost vermilion. It was so brilliant. So uh, uh, the other trees will follow the lead and they will become uh, possibly the reds, the yellows, and everything that everybody is, you know, really anticipating after a very long, hot, dry summer, which I found sometimes tiresome. Uh, this uh, kind of grayish mass back here looks like it's a cutout, but I'm going to do some details, as I did on another study of this general area, where these egrets um, and uh, some heron are, are uh, resting before their incredible uh, trip south. Uh, I'm going to show you that down below here there is a um, there is a shadow of all this of all this stuff and a, a little bit of um, 
a little bit of indication that there are trees casting shadows on themselves and on the ground and so on. So it's all kind of dark in the distance. And uh, that's an interpretive kind of thing. It comes from trying to uh, find some subtlety in the application of the color, small, uh, small strokes, uh, texture, keeping um, uh, texture in mind, and then of course the general feeling that this is a painting and it can be uh, an improvisation as well as a, as well as being conscious of detail. So uh, the darkness at the bottom of this landmass is important because against it are going to be uh, other little things that are going to manifest themselves, such as a wonderful bank of uh, brilliantly sunlit marsh grass. I'm going to enhance it somewhat because um, uh, I recall it as being much more brilliant than what the monitor is showing, so I'm going to use my own, uh, my own remembrance uh, as well as the reference material at hand to, to see if I can not get a little bit more brilliance. There's something, something in the transmission here that is robbing me of all that lovely pale uh, ochre yellow that was out there uh, on the top of the marsh. Uh, the marsh, of course, is always extremely uh, colorful. It goes from a bright uh, yellow-green in, uh, in the spring to very deep and uh, luscious darker green. It's all Spartina grass out there, and it has a, um, it has a wonderful resiliency to, uh, to uh, weather problems. It, uh, it will come back no matter what, it seems, uh, in many colors. And, of course, in the fall, it has, the, uh, it has that uh, yellow ochre quality which uh, I have already mixed on my on my palette here. Um, let me let me scumble what I just did to show you what I mean by that. This is a brush without any paint on it. It's a perfectly clear brush, and I'm going to scumble. That means I'm going to d dilute and get rid of a lot of that. Um, of a lot of the harsher dark puddles of color to try to get some feeling about the texture of those trees back there. If it doesn't work this time, I'll go back to it later, which is what painters always do. They go back to areas which need to be refined. But for the most part, this is about what I'm going to leave it at for now. Uh, I'll give you some highlights a little bit later, but I want to keep this somewhat dark because uh, my plan is to show you how wonderful the white egrets look when they're sailing, or sailing, well, actually sailing, uh, against this um, dark uh, landmass background here. There is a plan afoot, and I just let you in on it. Well, we have here the beginning of a uh, of the uh, interpretation of this marsh. The um, I've um, pre-mixed some because I uh, happen to have run out of yellow ochre. So having mixed some of it, it's right here on my palette. Here's this nice big puddle of very, of very uh, ochery ochre. It's um, it's a spectrum yellow, a touch of a touch of uh, burnt sienna, a touch of uh, mauve tone. So I'm going to run this across here to show you uh, that the um, this is what I remember of the scene. And you may not be seeing this on your monitor but this is closer to what it really was like. And I think it'll make for a, a really intriguing painting. It's, it's a, a sort of green there on the monitor, but what it was was in places extremely brilliant yellow ochre. Um, you would find that you would do this uh, out there as well, because sometimes when I'm out painting, the cloud comes over and robs the uh, brilliance of some of the color down below of its, uh, of its, um, of its brilliance. And um, I wait for that cloud to go away so that it will remain, get brilliant again. So uh, you can in fact uh, fool with the uh, fool with the color tones and I'm fooling with the color tones now because the uh, because the transmission from the monitor is in my opinion not quite as bright nor as exciting as it was when we were there. But you can see that the color scheme is already beginning to sort of be pretty neat and um, I like, to, uh, I like to deal with neat color schemes. It gets kind of pale here where the grass is shorter. Uh, when the grass is shorter, it seems to fade quicker and it does not retain color as often as, as much as the uh, longer grasses, which are in the background. And these grasses are, uh, are extremely uh, soft. Uh, they look as though they're made of velvet. Uh, actually, probably if you walked on them, you would be in intense pain. But this is where the egrets are spent spending their time in these short grasses over here. Uh, you can see them rising out of, the, um, out of the marsh when you're out there, and do by all means go if you possibly can and watch these uh, amazingly beautiful uh, soaring creatures uh, as soon as you can, because they're not going to be there that long. Um, 
uh, the uh, the pale uh, the pale grasses from which they swoop and dive are right there, uh, and and uh, this is the area that I'm just uh, that I've just put in here for these pale colors. It's all sort of magical. I must tell you, when you're out there, you really wonder how long it's been since you saw something quite as beautiful. Anyway, with that poetic comment, I'm going to break for just a moment. I need to squeeze out some more white, but I'll be right back. The quantity of paint that I can get on my hands is uh, is really amazing. Uh, so during the break, I not only squeeze out more white, but I also remove paint from the hands. Uh, anybody who wants to paint and does not want to get paint on their hands, uh, you better uh, quit before you start because there's no way of avoiding it. And um, it's not a complaint, it's just a statement of fact. Here we have a uh, part one of a, of a wonderful scene, which is really uh, just an excuse, uh, sort of, to uh, incidentally show you how to do this kind of thing, but also to tell you about these birds. And um, maybe there are some people out there that don't give two, two hoots about birds, but um, I think for the most part everybody is really sort of taken in by the mystery of the way the birds behave, where they go, how they, how they do things, and, and the fact that they are there at all times for, uh, for uh, our, uh, our amazing amazement and enjoyment. Out here in this, uh, in the, I'm, what, I'm now, what I'm now doing is the next band of color that is working its way towards the foreground of this composition um, with a, a slightly deeper tone of green than there is in the background, but not too much deeper. It's, uh, it's similar because it's still in the distance. And it's uh, banks of uh, other uh, beach type growing um, uh, bushes and uh, uh, grasses. This is probably a, uh, a bank of undisturbed beech plums. That foliage looks like it, but it could also be another one who's the, 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 another type of green that I have uh, quite forgotten, but which is extremely uh, pretty in color, but very unfriendly in texture. If you ever uh, are running up and down this creek in a canoe or a, a small paddle boat or something, and you need to get off and think that you can walk over on these marshes and have a good time observing, you you had uh, better, I think, have uh, your shoes with you because it is, um, it's very deceiving. It looks wonderfully smooth and friendly and inviting, but what it is actually is uh, killing on the feet. I've done it for a very, very long time, and uh, the only joy that I ever had was when I happened to have some shoes on. Uh, so uh, just little, little side pieces of information for anybody who happens to be thinking about going and investigating the marshes here. Anyway, as far as the, bir as the birds are concerned, uh, it isn't just the egrets that I'm talking about. It's a, it's a, a, a rather large variety of other ones. Uh, during this shoot, uh, uh, there was uh, there were um, 
it was a flock of a flock. I don't know if five or six birds is considered a flock, but there certainly was a gaggle of crows, huge black things. Oh, are they ever big? And are they ever uh, noisy and wonderful and graceful and absolutely fabulous? Uh, pe a lot of people hate crows. I think they're I think they're as great as any bird can get because they are audaciously. Uh, bird-like. Uh, they just go where they please and they have that, uh, that um, incessant caw and of course they are up early in the morning which is my thing and I, and I dearly love crows. So me and Edgar Allan Poe and the raven. Uh, but here is a little, a little tiny sort of a snip of beach there. Sand has, has been revealed and uh, that little white uh, spit of sand right there is, uh, is uh, typical. Uh, I'm putting it in with some quick drying white because there are some things that are going to have to be painted in front of it. There we are. Now comes the uh, moment of, of mixing the proper tone for the very pale, pale uh, grass that is in that, uh, that, is in that middle ground. Uh, right here, right there, this pale middle grass. It is predominantly white. And I'm going to put it on with a palette knife because I think it's probably more efficient that way. Let's see if I can pull this off and make that look like the grass that it is. If I can't, I'll go in there with a fine brush and, uh, and try and make those, the, uh, the uh, tops a uh, little bit uh, feathery uh, the way they are. But the, the palette knife seems to be working fine. Um, it also is a quick way of being able to get this, uh, this uh, large bank of very pale tone. And I'm going to avoid that little beach place that I just put in there. There's that little white uh, area that, um, that I just popped in there for the reason that I needed to um, prepare it for, this, for, for receiving this green, this pale green. The pale green is nothing more than uh, uh, some sap green and a great deal of quick drying white uh, put on with a palette knife and not hesitatingly to put it on rather thick. Uh, I think maybe a little bit more yellow in there will, s will serve us better. From looking at the monitor, there's a little bit more yellow in it uh, along here. But anyway, uh, the excitement that one, uh, that one gets by working out in the, uh, in the open is evident uh, by the fact that I'm out in the open all the time. Uh, I, my studio is a, uh, is a nice place to keep my paints, but my studio is actually the planet. I find that the, uh, the, my, my presence in my studio is uh, reserved for uh, cold winter months when I do still life landscapes and por I mean um, uh, still lifes, florals and portraits. And the rest of the time I'm out there with the bugs and the sun and the wind and the water and the whatever it is else is that turns me into a landscape painter. Uh, here is the, uh, here are, let me see, let me, let's count the colors. One, two, three, with the dark, four, five, six, seven colors so far, all rather subtle, but all very typical of the place that we're looking at. Now, uh, somewhere along here, there is going to be darkness coming because uh, all things cast a shadow, including uh, millions of blades of grass, and the shadow, of course, finds itself at the bottom of this of uh, this, um, well, what would you call this? This bank of grasses. And there are breaks in it. Uh, I'm doing this with a brush, even though the palette knife um, put on the prime coat. Uh, I've, I've mentioned before that you can, in fact, mix techniques, uh, which I do occasionally and probably more often than I even realize. Uh, I use what I think is going to work at the moment. Uh, so, as you've, you've probably seen me stick my fingers in the paints. Uh, more than likely why I get such a remarkable quantity of paint on my fingers when I'm painting. Um, I, uh, I find myself uh, really more intrigued than I, can, that I, than I can tell you in words without boring you half to death with what interests me. But I, but I always like to sort of share things. And um, when I have taken people out on painting trips with me, they uh, not only are uh, sort of mesmerized by their environment and by the fact that we have actually stopped long enough to sit and really observe what is happening around, but they also can't wait to go back. So um, even though I, uh, at one time I used to take classes out to paint, and I just don't do that anymore, I do it for myself. I go and paint out of doors myself. Um, and it has never stopped being one of the 
one of the more amazing experiences in my painting life is to be out there in the environment doing this. I, ha I find that I'm going to need to take a brush, and if you'll get, if you see some real closeness here, I can show you the, the way in which the detail of getting this grass to um, to have its uh, to have a texture to it is by using a brush full of turpentine and simply picking up some of the wet paint that is down here, and you will see that it uh, it practically uh, paints itself. Just some turpentine. You do not need any paint on here at all. You um, you the uh, the paint will be picked up by the wet bristles of the brush. Uh, a nice little technique uh, which you will find yourself using time and time again if you ever have the, if you ever find the chutzpah to start in the first place, to, to get a brush full of turpentine and start to play texture games with it. This is the texture game for the grasses. Very, really quite vital uh, in order to get the resemblance of the place in which you are working. Uh, back here I see that there's a break in the grasses here, uh, sort of um, quite necessary for me to make my audience believe what is happening back there. There is a break. So, we have uh, time, of course, is running out on this part one of, uh, of, my, uh, of my environmental study of this uh, lovely uh, area known as the Salt Marsh in, in, uh, in West Meadow Beach. Here is the final, uh, before we close, so somewhat the final dark mud bank uh, out of which this grass is growing. It is pure uh, spectrum brown and it's put on in a rather interpretive way. It is the, um, it's the dark, wet, muddy uh, substance from which this Spartina grass has taken root, into which this Spartina grass has taken root, and in which, uh, which it separates it very effectively from the rest of the um, from the rest of the uh, of the grasses, it's uh, it's there. You can see it. Uh, all you have to do is to get there and just stare at it for a minute, and there it is. That mud bank. I'm going to use a sort of a little uh, of a little scumbling technique here with this little brush, which is sort of a disaster brush, but it's exactly what I wanted to do. It's because hairs are sort of loose and really sort of dead, but it's going to give a um, give a little bit of uh, break to this harsh dark line of the mud mud, mud bank. All techniques which uh, I use and which I find uh, may be uh, of tremendous use to the people who are going to begin painting. Well, uh, with a minute to go, I think I'll probably uh, begin to a very, a very uh, uh, subtly, if I possibly can. I'm not especially subtle. My colors are subtle, but I'm not really subtle. Is to put this is to begin to to interpret this tree in the last few closing moments up in the area where I've already painted. And this is the um, the wonderful cedar that I talked about in a couple of other shows with its pointy, very typical uh, branches that um, that are uh, so typical of this type of evergreen. This evergreen, of course, is this this um, cedar is going to change color. Uh, we don't think that evergreens do, but this one, in a matter of uh, weeks, when it gets really frosty and cold, is going to turn a sort of a, well, a greenish sienna color. It's going to be quite dark and have a lot of brown in it. And uh, the feeling will be that it's probably dying, but it isn't. Uh, so with my strokes in the cedar tree, Sounds, sounds very um, poetic. Uh, I'm going to close this program, tell you that it's part one of a study, and part two will be hopefully following it somewhere. If you can't find it, look on channel 14 for your program guide. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.